Hi, everybody. Uh, my presentation is on my project, which is thusly entitled Modern Invasion Tactics and Bumblebees and Consequences for the Local Community. I was uh, I spent the past nine months looking at uh, invasive bumblebee, Bombus terrestris, uh, which was introduced uh, a couple of decades ago and uh, is displacing the native bumblebee, Bombus del Bumai. And, uh, and yeah, uh, like a lot of other people's projects, uh, some things went well and other things had to be altered. So some quick review of kind of the system and the reason why this is an important question. Uh, pollinators are enormously important. Uh, Hymenoptera and the family of, uh, in which all the bees are, are kept and uh, the wasps and, and whatnot are especially so and especially, especially honeybees and bumblebees. And uh, so the looking at plants and pollinators is really important because pollination is an essential ecosystem service, economically hugely important around the world, uh, people depending on it for food as well as their livelihood. Uh, but also just from a natural point of view, uh, pollinators and the mutualism they form with plants is uh, very, very important from just the, the stability of any given ecosystem. Uh, and the big point about honeybees and bumblebees and why they are so spread around the entire world is because in our current, uh, in, in modernity, we have huge scale uh, agricultural practices with uh, a large dependence on the movement of pollination services across international and national borders. So for example, in the US, uh, when it comes time for the, the start of the, the growing season, there's a huge industry in transporting semi-loads of honeybees or bumblebees around the, the country to go uh, pollinate the, the, the almond trees or the orange trees or, or blueberries or, or whatever. Um, and this causes lots of different problems. It causes uh, issues of stress on the bees, uh, as well as a lot of uh, introduction of new, of these species to new places. For, and that's what's happened here, uh, is that bumblebees were introduced because they are very good pollinators compared to honeybees, especially in southern, or well, in the northern and southern latitudes. Uh, and this is because they are very large, they're hairy, uh, and because of this, they're also able to thermoregulate. Uh, for, in order to achieve flight, they have to warm up their, uh, their muscles sufficiently to be able to fly, uh, and there's a whole like thermoregulation economics that they have to work out. But honeybees, which are kind of the more popular around the world uh, source of pollination services, is, are unable to do this. Uh, so bumblebees, when you get down to areas like Patagonia, where you have really strong winds, a lot of precipitation, uh, usually a lot of precipitation, they are unable to be able to be uh, utilized efficiently. And furthermore, there's certain plants and a lot of the crops that are important to Chile's uh, agricultural economy necessitate buzz pollination, uh, wherein the, uh, the sacks of, of pollen are tightly kept, and so you need a bug that's robust enough to be able to shake the pollen loose, and bumblebees are able to do this. Uh, going forward, something to keep in mind is that there is kind of like, you can classify bumblebees into two large groups of the long and the short tongue, which is looking at the proboscis, uh, which affects what plants they can uh, pollinate efficiently and, um, and leads to a lot of co-evolutionary uh, adaptations over time uh, in a given ecosystem. And so when you bring in a new species, uh, that wasn't evolved with certain plants, uh, they will might uh, form break mutualisms or just preferentially uh, pollinate other invasive plants and create kind of a bad spiral for a native ecosystem. So the species of interest for me were primarily Bombus del Bomai, uh, down there, uh, which is the native bumblebee, it's the largest bumblebee in the world, uh, and it's been it's 2015, it was uh, added to the IUCN's um, endangered species list uh, because of two introductions of bumblebees for pollination services. So a while back, Bombus ruderatus was introduced uh, the, and that uh, correlated with a decline in populations of the native species, but not like a terrible, terrible crash. 
but then when Bombus Trashfus appeared on the uh, in Chile and spread over into Argentina, that's when we really saw a huge reduction in the the, um, the regions in which you saw Bombus delboni, as well as the population density in locations where it persisted. Uh, and then also there's two uh, yellow jackets that have been introduced, and um, they are they're kind of they're they're another factor involved in, in things that are going on and potential consequences for the local community of plants. So one of the first things I wanted to do, or one of the first things that uh, I was thinking about was kind of this this the range expansion. Uh, Bombus del Boma, or Bombus terrestris rather, has been expanding its range at about 200 kilometers per year, uh, based off of um, some estimates on uh, at presence absence over a couple years. And they were originally introduced in 1997 in central Chile, uh, kind of this area-ish, and then spread rapidly southward and uh, over the mountains into Argentina. Um, and originally, I thought it would be fantastic to go down to Punta Arenas, where, as far as the literature was concerned, uh, Bombus terrestris did not exist yet. So for example, in the, the IUCN 2015 report in which they decided that, uh, or officially classified Bombus del Bomai as endangered. Um, the, the most up-to-date information I had was that Magellanus is the, the only region where uh, Bombus terrestris had not yet arrived. And unfortunately, this was not at all the case. Uh, so upon arriving to Punta Arenas, uh, I saw Bombus terrestris pretty much immediately, and it took a long time before I saw any del Bomai. Um, and so I was curious about, you know, when it, it had occurred, because that's very important. Uh, and so I went and talked to a, a few different people, uh, and there's kind of a conflicting narrative on a lot of fingers being pointed. Uh, Inia apparently did bring Bombus terrestris down to do like a, an in-house um, experiment on the effect of, if, if fruit set was uh, increased by Bombus terrestris on certain plants. And of course, it, was, it wasn't a very well done experiment. Uh, but apparently independent farmers also like, you know, heard that they were doing this and started importing all of these down there uh, because as of still, there, there's no regulation on the import of all of these outside of making sure that, trying to make sure that they don't have any pests or parasites, but there's no control on the, the importation of them. And thus, they entered Magajanes and have been there for two or three years um, and potentially have invaded the entire continent. So, Punta Arenas is right up there. That's where I was based. This little edge here is the very, very southern tip of the continent itself. Over here is uh, Tierra del Fuego, the Isla Grande Tierra del Fuego. And I uh, have some collections of specimens basically as far south as the road goes, uh, 66 kilometers south of Punta Arenas. Uh, and so, anyways, this, this altered very much uh, how I was thinking about the system. I thought I'd be able to explore where the invasion front was, uh, as well as look at Dalbamai in uh, an as of yet uninvaded system. Uh, and this had consequences as well for how I'm thinking about um, modeling the, the system, because now I don't know for sure where the clean invasion front is. If Bombus terrestris would have already reached that far south anyways, where the, uh, the new introduction has spread outwards. Uh, so looking at, like, specimens I've collected up in this area are those ones that have come, populations that have spread from the central area of Chile southwards or northwards from Punta uh, Another thing I'm interested in is the consequences for the community, and here is one great example. Uh, so nectar robbing, uh, going back to like long versus short proboscis, uh, nectar robbing occurs when a pollinator uh, pollinates or, or forages illegitimately. Uh, so, for example, on Fuxia magajanica, you can see these holes that are nod into the, the corolla so that the bumblebee can get straight to the nectar. And this is, happens because it's a very long tube. And so Bombus del Bomai, which is co-evolved with this system, has a proboscis that's long so that it can reach all the way up to where the nectar is. And so we'll come in kind of, you know, from below normally and be able to collect the pollen while it's looking for the reward. Bombus terrestris, which is a short tongue species, and other short tongue species have special dentition that they've evolved on their mandibles that allows them to nectar rob. And so the interesting, the, the very interesting thing though is that it's a socially transmissible 
behavior. Uh, bumblebees are, and bees generally in most of Hymenoptera are very smart and capable of learning new behavior, uh, for, uh, forming associations with different scent cues. But what happens is that in the presence of Bombus terrestris, Bombus delbulumai will also forage illegitimately. And so what the consequences are for the fruit set of Fuchsia and, um, and how that eroded mutualism might play out in the system is not, well, you know, there's a lot of hypotheses around that. And when I get back to Punta Arenas, I'm going back down to that area uh, down here to, to be able to collect more data on that and some observations and look at that. Uh, people who've already worked up, there's one paper from Chiloé and, uh, well, two papers from kind of that Chiloé region that have looked at this and documented that it's occurring there as well. There's a guy over who did a, a research internship over in Argentina who also has some data that it's happening there as well. The other interesting thing is that the yellow jacket is getting involved. Uh, at the time when I made these observations last April, um, I could not determine if yellow jacket is also a primary nectar robber or if it's a secondary nectar robber like Delbo might just taking advantage of the holes that are there. Uh, variance in this behavior is also interesting. Yeah. So this is a video from the end of the season. So uh, assumedly these are well-matured foragers who have, are, are, you know, they're not young. They, they've already learned how to deal with flowers. And And so the interesting thing is that their, how they approach flowers vary between individuals. Uh, so if the videos work, I'll be able to show you, but some of the Delbomai would go directly for the holes. So they had, they knew that the, to look for the, the hole first and to go and uh, suck the nectar through that. Other individuals though decided or had kind of they were, were foraging, trying to forage legitimately first. So they would go underneath and try to get the nectar through the bottom. And then they would go up. So what this video is supposed to show is that he, or she, rather, goes up and then go, try, checks for a hole. And then goes to the next flower and repeats that. Whereas other individuals would just look for the, they knew, or they had broken completely the, the mutualistic uh, behavior and were just going straight for uh, nectar bottom. The other thing I'm interested in it is why Bombus terrestris has been so successful. Uh, and there's a couple different reasons why this might be. Uh, for example, phenology, which refers to just kind of like the times of year that uh, plants are flowering or that the, the bees are active. So Bombus terrestris definitely has a longer uh, period of activity during the year. So it emerges from hibernation earlier. Uh, there's some results from some other countries that compared to the native bumblebees in those areas, it absolutely emerges with higher fat stores, so it already is healthier when it comes out of hibernation. Uh, this also plays into how there, there's invasive ornamental plants that have been introduced as well, and those are tend to be the flower, flowers that are flowering when, um, when Bombus terrestris uh, appears. And so this lets Bombus terrestris uh, get kind of the, the best apartment on the block, uh, as well as get like a very large population going before Bombus del Bomai comes out. So that's something I've been documenting with uh, this, the start of this season, is looking at when do I see what species where, uh, as well as what flowers are flowering at what time of year. The other thing I'm interested in is uh, genetics on, for both the, both of the species, for the uh, Bombus terrestris, hopefully I'll be able to look at the, the genetics of the different populations I've collected in different areas to be able to determine if that invasion front coming down from the north really reached all the way down south, or, uh, or if the bomb stressors started out in Buda and it's spread out from there. Uh, an interesting complication with that is that because there's only a handful of companies from which uh, farmers are able to import uh, bomb stressors, there's, uh, I don't know for sure, but there could be complications in terms of just the, the genetics that are being set up to start a population anyways, and that could be messy in terms of figuring out uh, where populations have been spreading from. The big hypothesis, though, is that pathogens are what is affecting the native bumblebee. So there's been a little bit of work in Argentina and in Chile 
uh, but the work that's been done is based off samples from several years ago, uh, and the work in Chile has only focused on kind of the, the, the Chiloé area as the southernmost point. So I have a, hundreds of bumblebees that I'm going to be taking to the USDA ARS uh, Pollination Center in Logan, Utah, and I'll be dissecting them, matching them up, looking at the DNA in them, uh, and doing a bunch of work to be able to determine presence and absence of a lot of these uh, parasites, uh, if that transmission has occurred, if the native species has these, and um, and yeah, and looking at the genetic spread. And then also looking at pollen samples to be able to see what flowers these different bumblebees are interacting with, uh, and be able to build from that uh, an understanding of what potential vectors of transmission there are out there. So what flowers these two species share, and that would be like a node where the pathogen could have been spread through. Uh, another bit that I will hopefully be able to glean some information on is how urban areas are affecting the populations and the, the density of populations. So one of the things that I've noticed uh, in Punta Arenas is that um, there's much, like there, there's basically no native bumblebee. But once you get a few kilometers out of the city and down towards the south, then you do start seeing the, the native species. So the Bombus terrestris is definitely the dominant species, but the relative abundance is not so terribly. Um, cities also have a ton of ornamentals that are introduced uh, from, <coughs> from the Mediterranean. Uh, and those, of course, Bombus terrestris is already very good at utilizing those sources, and Bombus delboma likely is less so. Uh, there was a great patch uh, formed after a disturbance on Instituto de la Patagonia, which is my hosting institution, um, on their campus, where they had torn up a bunch of area with some, some construction, and uh, thistle, there, there was a huge monoculture of thistles and, uh, and raspberries. And for example, there, the only species that I saw over a couple months span of, uh, of surveys was Bombus del Bomai, or Bombus terrestris, sorry. Um, unfortunately, I was hoping to be able to start like analyzing, looking at that area again at the start of this season, but there was more construction, and this is now just like a dirt patch. But if pending further funding, it'd be really great to come back and kind of watch what the successional sequence is in that disturbance patch and what pollinators are coming in and interacting there. Uh, so, uh, sorry, um, trebles, uh, the clover. Uh, clover and, uh, and dandelions are all over the place, uh, and especially late in the season and early in the season uh, when Bombus terrestris is way more dominant. Uh, the only flowers that they're really associated with from my observations have been these introduced invasive plants as well. Uh, yeah, and so some of the sites I have around town uh, are helping me look at different disturbance regimes. So Parque Maria Betty is uh, is a green space in the in the city that has much lower disturbance from <coughs> human activity, uh, as opposed to areas along the Costanera, which. Uh, are constantly seeing upkeep on, on roads, people walking through all the time, uh, as well as just being a different, uh, there's no flowers there except for the dandelions and clover. Beyond Punta Arenas, I've worked in a bunch of different areas. Uh, so again, end of the comment here, uh, Isla Grande, Tierra del Fuego, I've uh, been to a bunch of different islands in the area, and then up to Puerto Natales and some work up in Chiloé and hopefully collecting some species here now. In Tierra del Fuego, uh, I spent just a few hours in Porvenir, but I didn't see any bombus there, but there are records of the native species kind of on that northern edge of the, the island. I spent time down uh, near kind of like the edge of the Chilean portion of Tierra del Fuego in Caroquinca Park, which is a fantastic park run by uh, Wildlife Conservation Society. I spent a week there, didn't see any bombus, but I was able to uh, collect using um, water bowl traps the, some of the pollinators there, and so hopefully I'll be able to look at, or add to the, the knowledge of, of what um, pollinator invertebrates there are in the area. Some <coughs> other islands I went to are Carlos Tercero and Islote Rupert. 
uh, traveled with some other researchers from the Instituto Patagonia who already had a boat uh, set up to go there and were kind enough to invite me along. Uh, there's been two sightings in the past year of the native species on Carlos de Cero. Uh, there's a year-long survey or whale watching in, in this area. Uh, and so there's always research instruments in there and they were able to collect two specimens from you there, uh, but no terrestrials yet. Uh, and so all these islands so far are free of, of invasion, um, and that is hopefully good for as reservoirs of population for the, the native species. I also went down to the very southernmost uh, permanent city in the world, in Puerto Williams, uh, where they have the Amora Ethnobotanical Garden. Uh, and they were kind enough to host me for a week there as well. Um, there was no bombus sighted at all, uh, but there was presence of, of yellow jackets there. So I was able to collect some yellow jackets. Uh, and then I also worked up in, in Chile. This is where most of the work that's been published, the, the few studies that have been published, have mostly been from this area. And so I wanted to get up there and be able to collect some of the specimens from there to be able to use in my own analysis, be able to compare better kind of what's going on. Uh, I again uh, saw a lot of uh, nectar robbing going on. Uh, an interesting thing about this system is that there are also solitary bees and honeybees in the area, uh, which uh, adds to the diversity of pollinators and also other interactors for them to be competing against. Uh, yeah. And yeah, perfect. Uh, so I have a ton of people to thank uh, at my host institution. There was a ton of people who were super helpful in making, helping me make connections with people at the various forest services and these other uh, field sites, um, the folks at Ethno, uh, Parque Ethnobotanico Mora, uh, Parque Caruquinca, um, some folks who were kind enough to Skype with me and share their expertise, as well as uh, promise me their expertise in the future when I go and work on these specimens in Utah, uh, the Fulbright Commission, and um, some fantastic friends that I made down south.